<laughs> good morning. Good evening. It is Wednesday, November 25th. Um, this is this is my Bible study. We're in the book of Matthew. Yes, yes. I, I checked the public thing uh, first. Now, that's my first thing to make sure that it's public and not only me. Why is there an only me setting? Okay, doesn't matter. Okay, it's all about me. So, um, we, we're in the Matthew chapter 24. I'm going to actually skip ahead. And some of you are saying, oh, thank God, if he just, if he recapped one more time, I'd have to slip my wrist. But uh, so, as, as we know, the, the disciples have asked three questions. Because Jesus said, see all these stones? This temple is going to be thrown down, uh, torn down. When, when is that going to happen? And what would be the sign of your coming in power to take over the, and, and the Roman Empire? And when will be the sign of the end of the age? So he's answering those three questions. He's not answering any other questions. No one said, and 2,000 years from now, what will happen? He's only answering those questions. And, and Jesus is very clear. There's some of you standing here. You won't taste of death before everything that I just told you happens. But uh, we'll get to the scriptures that we often just say, but this, 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 this sounds like the 20th century, the 21st century. It's not, though. We're stuck. Okay. Uh, so... Where am I? I am here. Find the Word document. Found it. Now, um, I want to read something out of Luke chapter 21, because I'm actually skipping ahead. <laughs> oh, thank you, Jesus. Um, Luke chapter 21, verse 24. Uh, Jesus gave the same lecture in Luke. Uh, well, I mean, Luke, Matthew, Mark, John. Uh, not John. But that Ma uh, Luke, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John all recorded this. And... Uh, they each one left out this first one left out that, you know, because no one can remember. They didn't have tape recorders. So to the best of their memory, it's amazing how good they were and how close everything is. Because you try to get people today to have, who've seen an accident happen to all show up at court and tell the exact same story. But these they told the exact same story. It's really excellent. Um, but Luke uh, expresses one thing in a different way. I just want to look at it. Luke chapter 21 verse 20 through 24, he says, but when you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, then know that its desolation is near. So th that'll be a cue. Oh, look, there are armies surrounding. This happened in 67, the year 66 and a half AD. And it was a three and a half year period that these armies surrounded Jerusalem. And then in 70 AD, they attacked. So he says, Why, right in 66 and a half AD, when you see this happening in June of 66 AD, get out because it's going to start happening. So he says, uh, verse 21, then let those of you who are in Judea flee to the mountains and let those who are in the midst of her depart and let not those who are in the country enter. Like, don't come back in, get out. Um, so that's what the house always says, get out, but people stay for some reason. For these are the days of vengeance, that all things which are written may be fulfilled. Whose vengeance? God's on the wicked. But woe to those who are pregnant and those who are nursing babies in those days, for there will be great distress in the land and wrath upon his people. On this people... For they will fall by the edge of the sword and be led away captive into all nations. So he's really clear. You'll be in, when you see, now he doesn't say whose armies will invade, but <laughs> as soon as you see armies invade, I wonder if those are the armies he meant. Let's wait and see. So when you see the armies go, because they're going to come in, capture you, and you'll be led away captive into all nations, and Jerusalem will be trampled by Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles are fulfilled. And this is a kind of big phrase. What are the times of the Gentiles? The times of the Gentiles. Now I've got to check. Oh good, okay, I look normal. I mean, the camera looks normal. I look like me, so bless my heart. Um, so he's saying, so there's something called the times of the Gentiles, and this is how long Jews, the Jerusalem will be trampled on by the Jews. I mean, by the, by the Gentiles, by the, all the other nations, until the, giant, the times of the Gentiles were filled. Notice in 1948, Jerusalem 
became a nation again and the Jews went back. So the time of the Gentiles is nearing an end. Um, so, but when did they begin? And what, what does he mean? And why is it called the times of the Gentiles? What does that mean? So we need to back up because that's all God's been talking about for 700 years is the times of the Gentiles, explaining that to the Jews. Um, and, okay, and this is the capper. Okay, so um, I'm just going to explain some history. And you'll, you'll know most of this, but maybe you've never heard it in order like this. In 760 BC, the, well, actually this happened in, uh, in 1000 BC, the, the Assyrians took over the entire Middle East. Um, well, no, that's not true. They took over a portion of the Middle East. And so someone said, if you can picture uh, an egg and then a grapefruit and then a basketball and then a watermelon, that each successive um, nation that comes and uh, takes over the Middle East, they conquer a little bit more land and a little bit more land and a little bit more land and a little bit, and it grows out. So Assyria was the first major empire, started however many thousands of years uh, BC, but they were really cruel. They were like, oh, not, not that they were benevolent, well, but there's some that are worse than others, and they were the worst. <laughs> they were the worst. So this is when God sent Jonah to their capital city, Nineveh, in 7060 AD and warned them, if you don't stop Nineveh, if you don't stop you Assyrians being so cruel and so horrible, God's going to judge you. And so they repented for a little bit. Um, and so God used them, as horrible as they were, as terrible as they were, in uh, 734 BC, so 760, 734, so we're getting closer to zero, right? In 734 BC, the, um, the northern kingdom of Israel was, was conquered. It was starting to be attacked by the Assyrians because Assyria, uh, Assyria is north. So um, they're starting to attack and they're coming down south. And um, Israel had been split in two. There were 10 tribes called the Northern Tribes and two tribes called the Southern Tribes, whatever names. Uh, and I always liken that to Northern and Southern California. I just picture LA as the Southern Tribe down at the bottom and the whole rest of California is the 10 other tribes. Okay, so um, Israel, the Northern King is, is being attacked uh, by um, Tilglath Pileser and Shalmaneser. Okay, those are two of the kings. And um, then in 724, 10 years after that, in 724, they kind of finished conquering the northern kingdom. So all 10 tribes are, are taken away. And the reason they deport them to Syria, instead of just conquering them and say, pay us, because the, the normal thing, you, you'd show up. We, 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 we talked about this with Sodom and Gomorrah, those of you who are watching in Genesis on Sundays. They normally just show up and threaten you. And, and then you pay them money and they control you now. And then, and then they go off. Uh, but you, they own you and you send them ta your taxes and you adopt their gods and you adopt their languages. They usually leave you where they are. But the reason they didn't do that to Israel is because Israel refused to adopt their languages and their gods and their, although that's why God was mad at them because they pretended they were refusing, but they, they kept doing it. You know, they kept, oh, I want to be like them and I want to be like them. And, and God's like, no, I want you to be like me. Stop being like them. Quit it. And, and so um, they kept serving those other gods and serving those other gods. But Judea, I mean, uh, yeah, the, the the two southern tribes, they really refused. They were, no, God told us that he's our God and there's only one God and we're not going to serve your gods. And so they're going to slowly attack them and eventually get to the, the, the bottom two tribes. So they said, we're going to have to take you and bring you where we are. And that way we can force you to learn our languages and force you to worship our gods. And then we can send you back and you're fine. So they couldn't leave them alone. So they took them away and they took them to Syria, but they never gave any sort of, um, you, you mean about in First Chronicles chapter 5, verse 26, if you're like, 
First Chronicles chapter 5, verse 26. It says, The God of Israel stirred up the spirit of Paul, the king of Assyria. His real name was that, was that Tilgath Pleser name. And the spirit, okay, oh, and the spirit of Tilgath Pleser, the king of Assyria. And he carried them away, even the Reubenites, the Gadites, and the half tribe of Manasseh. So he mentioned, because really, all 10 tribes didn't come over. Uh, two tribes and half of Manasseh stayed on the other side of the Jordan. So he says, even them, they even got them. So they didn't just get people who were in Canaan, uh, in Israel. They went on and got, you, you too, everybody's coming over. And um, it says that even the Reubenites, the Gadites, the half tribe, half tribe of Manasseh, and brought them into Hala and Harbor and Hara and the river of Gorzon unto this day, which means they never sent them back. Uh, they became known as the Ten Lost Tribes because once they captured those ten tribes, including Reuben and Gad, and they went across the river, they just kept them. There was never some sort of edict for them. You can now return to your land. And so they slowly just kind of trickled out. They, they, some of them assimilated. There were some Jews who assimilated some children of Abraham, children of Israel, who assimilated into the Assyrian culture. And to this day, some of them maintain their Jewish help, but they just lived there. This is why on the day of Pentecost and in, in, um, in the book of Acts, this is why on any Passover festival, Jews would come from all over the world and come back to, to Judea. They decided to make their home in these places. They're people who just lived in Assyria. Some Jews lived in Assyria and still held on to their faith. And, and some children of Israel, I'll say it that way. Uh, because Jews is actually the name of, of the last two tribes of Judah. And, and uh, that's why we call them Jews, because they lived in Judah. But you would call the rest of them children of Israel. They, um, some of them assimilated. They're still the children of Israel. There are, Jew, there are children of Israel to this day who are related to the Jews, whose great-great-great-grandparents a, a thousand years ago, uh, 2,000 years ago, assimilated into that culture in order to survive in their minds. This is why God to survive. And, uh, but they're still the children of Israel. And, and at some point, and they'll wake up, return to God, uh, and not even really knowing their, their whole heritage because their, their heritage was lost. That's why they're the 10 lost tribes. Some of them, um, if you remember that those eugenicist people that Noah's boat landed in the, the Caucasus mountains and, and in Syria, and they came down, uh, his three sons, Noah and his three sons, they came down and came south and they went east. Uh, and they filled up the rest of the Middle East. They filled up Africa. They went as far as China, obviously. But one of the sons, his people didn't migrate till way late and went over the Caucasus Mountains and went into, into Europe. Um, they, like they waited a long time before they did that. Some of the lost 10 tribes, they went over the Caucasus Mountains at this point. So like the tribe of Dan, uh, where we get the Blue Danube, and you, you can trace a lot of the names of the tribes the, that suddenly were coming over the mountains and into Europe. You can trace them back to the names of these 10 tribes. Um, so they settled in Britain. They settled in Scotland, in Germany. They settled in all these places. Um, and just and they're really children of Israel. Uh, and, and that's one reason why Europe, when the gospel spread to Europe, it caught on fire so easily in Europe. And they kind of embraced it once it finally got there. And then they went out and they were some of the biggest missionaries sending people all over the world because their ancestors, it's like, oh, I recognize that. You know, so when, so it's only 700 years later, I guess that doesn't seem, that's like a long time. But when Paul shows up and said, here's the gospel and he's, and he's showing them the Old Testament and because they didn't, the New Testament wasn't written, uh, wasn't put together. So Paul has to show them the Old Testament. They, they responded to it so quickly because their ancestors had kind of, taught them about this God. And so you're caught on fire quickly for the Lord. Okay, so um, the 10 tribes are there, but the two tribes have been left. 
God prevented the Assyrians from making it all the way down. Sennacherib um, didn't didn't uh, make it all the way down to Judah for a long time. So this is 734 and 724. The, the, the tribes are, 10 tribes are lost, but Judah's still trying to hang on to their faith. Okay. Um, now here's an interesting um, verse in, in Isaiah chapter 11. Verse 11 and then 12, Isaiah 11, 11 says, and it shall come to pass in that day that the Lord shall set his hand again the second time to recover the remnant of his people, which shall be left. So there was a first time, apparently, that Isaiah saw and a second time. So Isaiah is a different prophet because Isaiah actually is kind of peering into our day or 50 years from now or 100 years from now but he's really looking way into the future. He says there's going to be a second time when the remnant return. Now, some people say, oh, well, this is talking about Egypt and Babylonian captivity, but the, the entire, there were no remnants of the, all of Israel went from Egypt and came back to the promised land. The Egypt is not, so the first time is when the last two tribes are taken into captivity, into Babylonian captivity, they return. That's the first time. It hadn't even happened yet. Isaiah's prophesying about a first time that you're going to go back, but it wasn't the ten tribes. They didn't go back. The ten tribes never went back to the northern part of Israel. Um, the southern tribes went back after the Babylonian captivity. And Isaiah says, and there's going to be a second time when the remnant come back to Israel. And that is talking about what happened in 1948. So, so Isaiah did see 2,500 years ahead. And, and it says, the Lord shall set his hand again the second time to recover the remnant of his people, which shall be left from Assyria, from Egypt, from Pathros and from Cush. This is Africa. Uh, from Ilam and, and Shinar, this is China, and from Hamath and from the islands of the sea, the islands of the sea, and in their minds, that's Hawaii and Australia and, uh, you know, all these different islands. Okay, and he shall set up an ensign for the nations uh, and shall assemble the outcast of Israel and gather together the, the dispersed of Judah from the four corners of the earth. So he, so Isaiah, even though that, 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 First captivity hadn't even happened yet. The southern part of Israel hadn't been taken to Babylon yet. He still saw the second time. I'm going to gather them the second time. So the second time is a big deal. And that's why God was showing him, but we'll get to that. Anyway, so Sennacherib tries to capture the final two. They've captured the top ten tribes. They try to capture the final two, and they're unable to. You could read about that in 2 Kings 1935. So they tried to conquer Judah and Benjamin. Those are the last two tribes. They're not able to. And so Sennacherib went back to Nineveh. Now remember, Jonah had gone to Nineveh and said, you need to repent. They repented, and God used them to take the ten tribes and fulfill what he'd said would happen to them. Because Isaiah said, you're going to get in trouble if you keep messing up. And they kept messing up. So the ten tribes went to Assyria and kind of just dispersed. They, were never, they never came back to the north. What happened, though, is, um, and this includes the Samaritan. Samaria was the capital of the north, Samaria. Now, we always hear about uh, the woman at the wells from Samaria, the Samaritan woman. And when Jesus says, uh, who's my neighbor? And he says, the Samaritans. And they're like, oh, no, not them. And, you know, and he tells the parable. Why did they hate the Samaritans? Because uh, when, the, when the Assyrians took all of them out, and took them to Assyria, to Syria today, modern day Syria and Turkey, that area. Um, they brought other foreigners in to Samaria. Those, those were not the original Jewish people. And so the, um, the tribe of Judah, they resented them like, you're not our brothers, you're not our cousins. What are you doing here? They just filled you in and, you know, you, you're trying to gentrify this neighborhood. We don't like it. So you just, you, so, um, but they didn't leave. They, in fact, tried to adopt the Jewish religion and, and become part of it because because in Israel, that's what was happening, you know? So let's be like them. People love to adopt other people's religions, which is why God said, stay away from them. Not because he didn't like them, because it's too easy for you to just 
hang out. We've adopted the world. There's so much of the world that's crept into the church. There are things that we do that are totally worldly. We don't even realize it. It's just so easy to adopt attitudes and things of the world, and then they just come right into the church. So uh, the Samaritans became very much like the, the, those last two tribes that were left, but they hated, you're not, you're pretending to be us and you're not. Remember Jesus said, um, you know, the woman at the well said to him, where are we supposed to worship? Because you, you guys say we're supposed to worship in that, worship in that mountain, but we're, we think we should worship in this mountain because there was a whole thing that happened about where to build the temple. Once the temple was destroyed the first time, where should we build it? And the Samaritans wanted it built in their neighborhood. And they're like, what? You're not even Jewish. What do you get away? And, and so, so they built their own temple anyway. Screw you. We will build a temple. And so there's a big dispute over where we should worship. And she's saying, your people say that we should worship here. But our relatives who have now been here for 700 years, ever since those people all left, we say we should worship here. And Jesus is saying, neither place, neither place. There's now coming the day when the true worship was worship in spirit, where it has nothing to do with the building. We're still upset about buildings. I know we're still upset. You won't let us worship in the building. But God doesn't, he wants us to worship in spirit and know that wherever we go, we're the church. You can worship in your house. There'll be coming a time we can get back together in our buildings. But don't, don't get preoccupied with being mad about the building. Keep worshiping me. So the Samaritans were always competing with those bottom Jews. That doesn't sound right. Mm. The Jews that used to live in the South, the Southern Jews, the, that makes me make sense, mm. top and bottom of the North and South, the Southern uh, two tribes over which of one are more spiritual, okay? So um, Zephaniah and Nahum, and so, so Sennacherib tries to, to get those last two and take them up to Syria. God stops them because they still were basically holding on and doing what they're supposed to do. If we're holding on and doing what we're supposed to do, God will stop the enemy from coming and snatching us away. So they're still doing, basically, Judah is still worshiping God, so God protects them. Sennacherib goes back to Nineveh, and then that's when Nahum and, and Zephaniah say, okay, just because God used you in that way doesn't mean he's not going to punish you, because you still haven't changed your wicked, evil ways. And uh, they said, ha, 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 and God destroyed Nineveh in 612 B.C., right? In 612 BC. So the Jews are, who, who are left in those southern tribes, they're looking up at, at what happened to Nineveh and Syria and saying, oh, look, God destroyed that nation. So we're safe. We can do whatever we want. So meanwhile, Daniel, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, they are all prophesizing to the southern kingdoms. Those last two tribes are like dudes. There are no women there. They're all dudes, apparently. Guys. Oh, see, that's even a better word. People. Quit it. You've got to repent and come go back to God. Just because God punishes those people doesn't mean he won't punish you. So, because that's 612 BC. We're heading towards zero. 612 BC. All right. So Daniel, so a new kingdom arises, and, and the Assyrians are defeated by the Babylonians. Nebuchadnezzar and the Babylonians. And so they're the next kingdom to take over. They're the Gentile kings. The Gentiles just mean the nations. It means anybody other than the Jews that are called Gentiles. And so they take over. So we started with an egg, and now we've got the grapefruit. They take over a bigger area. They consume Assyria and now include what would today would be Iraq. So they Iraq, Syria, and that area. And then below a little bit of Egypt, they've got the, the, just the top of it. And and they're gonna they're closing in on... Israel. Israel's kind of right in the center of the whole thing. And Ezekiel, Daniel, Jeremiah warned them, if you don't, you'll fall prey also if you don't ship up. But it's, you know, God's not going to let anything happen to me. All right. Seven years later in 605 BC, Daniel's taken to Babylon along with a few of their top dignitaries, um, the, the three Hebrew children. Um, and they just took a few people there. They, their plan was to teach them their culture and then ship them back. Because Babylon is now, we've taken over everything. But the, that southern kingdom was like, no, we're still not going to take on your religion. But they weren't taking on God's religion either. They were like making up their own. So that, the, their plan was, we'll teach Daniel everything we know, send them back. And Daniel and them refused to learn. So in... Um, 
in about 587 BC, that's when they, so like 20 years later, they uh, take Ezekiel captive and um, I'm sorry, in 597 BC, 597 BC, they take Ezekiel and a bunch of them captive and take them to Babylon. And about the kings and the princes of Judah, they take them, but the majority of the people are still there. And they're like, well, they got them, didn't get us, <laughs> but they don't repent. And so that's why in 587 BC, 10 years after that, they come in and they take everybody captive. So now everybody is in Iraq, which was called Babylon at the time. And the temple is destroyed for the first time. Now Isaiah had warned them about those 150 years earlier, right? There's going to be a first time that the temple is destroyed, and then you're going to go back, and then there's going to be a second time. But after the second time, yes, you'll come back, but it's going to be a long time. Because if I have to come down there a second time, you're going to be in trouble. Don't let me take off my shoe. Don't let me come off this porch. So, I, you know, I let you get away with it once, but it, but the second time, that's it. All right. So, um, Jeremiah is also taken captive and taken to Babylon, but but he, there's like a few people left. There's a few people left in, in, in Judah and in Israel that are not taken there. And uh, uh, Jeremiah says, I got to really be with them. So he, they let Jeremiah go. And Jeremiah leads a small cadre of people first to Egypt. And then he leads them over into Europe. Uh, and they're part of the royal family that was not killed. People think that, the, that, that that whole line was killed. But there's part of it that was not killed. And the, he leads them into uh, over into Europe, and some people think that they became some of the royalty, because the, the prophecy is in the line of there will always be a, uh, one of the line of David will always be sitting on a throne. There's a second prophecy about the seed of David who will come and do what Jesus did, but but part of the whole thing with David is he will always have there will always be someone sitting on a throne if you are from David, so. Jeremiah led some of that royal family because they thought they killed them all to uh, Europe, and there's a whole big deal where they can they can trace it back. They think, and this one became king of this and king of that, and so and supposedly the whole British royalty that was them, you know, eh, you know. All right. So anyway, uh, here we are. The temple's been destroyed in 587 BC. And then 70 years later in 517 BC, because we're getting closer to zero, they're all we've already discussed this. They are they 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 send them back and go and say rebuild the temple. So they're able to go back. Jerusalem has been destroyed, but they say go back and rebuild the temple. Then there is a prophecy from Daniel. So so Ezekiel's there. Uh, Jeremiah was there for a hot minute. Daniel's there. So there's still some prophets in Iraq, in Babylon. And Daniel gets that prophecy that says, from the going forth of this of the decree to go back and rebuild the city will be a certain amount of years. And then Messiah is going to come. Because all of this, the 10 tribes being taken off to Assyria, and then the bottom two taken off to Babylon. People still weren't repenting. So that's Daniel. And we're going to read through Daniel. Daniel's very frustrated. Why aren't people, what's wrong with people? They are not repenting. And God's like, I know. And that's why Isaiah said, there's going to be a second, you know, tearing down of the temple. But, and they'll be scattered to all nations. But eventually I'll even let them back. So um, here's what's going to happen. And he lays out the whole, the whole timeline. And, uh, then so there's going to be a 49 year period, and then there's like a 400 and however many 50 something year period where, and then Messiah is going to come. So what's going on during that 400 year period? Because it, 49 years, it took 49 years to rebuild the city in 408 BC. So we're still heading to the city's rebuilt. So cool. And so everybody goes back to the city. So from 408 BC. Till 4 BC, which is exactly 404 years, because remember, Jesus was born in 4 BC because the guy was miscalculated. So from 404 BC, or 408 BC to 400 to 4 BC, what's happening during this time period? And these are Nebuchadnezzar's dreams 
Uh, so the whole book of Daniel, God is saying, well, here's what's going to go on during that time period until the Messiah comes. People have given other interesting interpretations. Well, this is talking about the 20th century. This is talking about, but it's not. He's simply explaining, here's what's going to happen. He's filling in the gaps because there is a gap between 408 BC and 4 BC when Jesus is born. And certainly 27 AD, 20, when he walks into Jerusalem and is, and is anointed, like what's happening during that pine tree period? So this is what happened. Uh, so Babylon is in charge, uh, which again is today modern day Iraq, and they've, they've taken up more area. Uh, and it's 408 BC. Um, 50 years later, the Greeks, led by Alexander the Great, come in. And there's the reason I'm telling you all this is because this is what in Daniel chapter 2, Daniel chapter 7, Daniel chapter 9, Daniel chapter 11, this is what God is explaining to them. So first let's go over, so we all are agreed on the history. And then when we read what he's saying, we'll go, oh yeah, that's that, that's that. It's so easy to read the Bible when you know the history. So Alexander the Great shows up and in a, in a whole, and just like a, He's 30 years old. He actually dies at 33. Very interesting because Jesus died at 33. But because um, he's like the Antichrist. Um, in, in 12 years, he takes over the entire known world. And now he's expanding it from Greece all the way to India. So it's, it used to just be Israel, Syria, and Iraq. And now it's Greece and Syria and Turkey and Iraq. And I ran, oh, I, right, all the way to India. Now, I'm sorry, I left out the, the, the Persians, the Iranians. Uh, while the um, Jews were in bondage, you know, from 587 BC to 517 BC, during that 70-year that 70 period, Cyrus comes in, He's, and that's the Medes and the Persians come in, the Iranians come in, and they um, attack and defeat, it's like Iran defeated Iraq, right? And Iran and Iraq have been in war forever. That's that's a thing that will always be happening. Um, so so um, the Persians come in, the Iranians come in, and now they expand the area, right? So now it's Israel and Syria and Turkey and Iraq and Iran and a little bit more of the of northern Africa, and uh, and then. That's when 60 years later, Greece adds in. So now we've got Greece and we go all the way to India. We've got this shoot. It's, so it's just getting bigger. It went from the egg to the grapefruit to the basketball. Um, and so <sighs> he dies in, in 323 BC, Alexander the Great. When he dies, because it's like sudden, what are we going to do? He's the one that did this whole thing. Um, they divide up. There's a there's like a civil war, and they divide the kingdom up into four sections, and um, the major sections are are the north and the southern king. So there's four generals who declare themselves king, basically of their areas. Um, there's an eastern and a western, and a southern and a northern. And um, the northern king are the Seleucids, and the southern king who's in the Egyptian area, because remember, they now they've gotten, they've conquered all of Egypt. Um, so the northern king is in Syria, and the Ptolemy, I say Ptolemy because it's P-T-O, it's probably Ptolemy, Ptolemy. <laughs> but I like saying Ptolemy to remind myself how to spell it. There's a P there and a T there. Um, so uh, that king and, and the northern the, and the southern king keep fighting with Israel in the middle. It starts in 323 AD and goes on for 150 years where they are fighting and one of them takes over Israel. There's a point where the, the Egyptians are winning and the Egyptians are over Israel. And then there's times when the Syrians are winning, the, the Seleucid king, and, and, and it just goes on and on, right? And there's the Seleucids, the first, the second, the third, the fourth, um, and each, each new son, grandson, great-grandson, goes to war with Egypt, trying to win. Well, finally, um, the Antioch, uh, the, the Seleucid king, 
in 175 because so they're fighting all the way from 323 to 175 over who's going to control alexander's empire because alexander was amazing you know as far as how far he went and how fast he took over and how much area he took over and again israel's at the center all of this they're always trying to get israel you got to come on our side you got to come on our side there was something about israel that they're always wanting to conquer them and, and control them um so the, these four generals, but it really came down to just two, are, are trying to find out. We want to control the whole area. And finally, his name was Antiochus. He called himself Antiochus Epiphanes, um, which kind of means the, the God manifest. Uh, Antiochus it means God. And, uh, you know, you have an epiphany. You, you oh, man. I finally got it. It it manifested itself. We use that word today where you have an epiphany. You it just the idea finally shows up in your head. Oh, I get it. So I am God, the uh Antiochus epiphany manifest. He he declares himself this, and uh he he reigned from 175 to 164 BC for just 11 years. But they had been trying to get Israel on their side all this time. Like they're trying to come to ours. Like come to, he made a concentrated attack on Israel. He was the first, instead of warring with each other, he's no longer warring. He's saying, I want Israel to serve me. And if you heard about the Maccabees, Jews Maccabee and that whole thing, this is, it's Antiochus Epiphany is the Greek that they were uh, fighting. Um, and okay, so, um, he he obtained now this is an important thing because we'll when we read in daniel he he was able to take over all that area by flattery he, he actually didn't use war to become the general he actually used flattery to do it and we'll explain that when, when we get there but that's that's an important clue uh when we're understanding the prophecies that are in daniel and so um He's trying to get the Jews to become totally Greek. Although he's stationed in the north in Syria, everybody's Greek. One good thing that happened during this time period is that they were so fascinated with the, with the, the, the Jews and their Bible and how they stuck to it. Because every other religion, they're adding in new gods all the time. They're, you know, but the Jews, like they had their history and their God, and they were really like, no. We're going to stick to this. And so the Greeks printed up their Bible uh, uh, and sent it all over the place. And so that's why everything is in Greek. That's what everybody was speaking Greek. The Greeks spread their culture during this time, right? Even in Jesus' day, they're speaking Greek. Paul's writing in Greek. Everything is, is Greek. And when Paul got certain places, they'd already heard about Jesus. Partly because, I mean, not Jesus, but they're, they'd already, they had the Bible there. He'd go to the temple. They they started little temples everywhere. That's kind of the birth of the, not the birth of the synagogue, but kind of, yeah, the birth of the synagogue in that um, they were they were like little teaching centers of Jewish history all over the, the Greek world. And so when Paul started, he'd show up, there was already a temple, there, uh, a synagogue there. And there was already a synagogue there, and it was synagogue, and you know, and he'd go in. That's the Greeks actually spread. God used them because God, you can't. Nobody wins. God wins. You know, you think <laughs> I'm showing God, and all the while he's using you to show everybody how incredible he is. So the so the Greeks are actually spreading God's word all over the known world. All right. So, but Antiochus is trying to attack the temple. He wants them to worship them. And in the temple at their time, there's two parties. There are the Hasidim, uh, and they're, they're, they're the really conservative. And then there's the more reform party who, who wanted, it's like, let's just give in and become Greek, you know? And the Hasidim are like, no, we, you, we're going to stay Jewish. And right, so obviously Antiochus Epiphanes, he loved them, him some reformed party. He, you know, and and Jacob was over the Reformed Party, and uh, he went to war with the with the Hasidim, and there's a big fight, which we'll get into that whole thing, 
And for a time, the reformed people who loved the Greeks and wanted, you know, let's just all become Greek. Forget the Hebrew and forget God and this is worship their gods. There was a time when they won and Antiochus went into the temple, which was, now this, again, this is Solomon's temple. It was like this incredible temple. Uh, and everybody was, it was the envy of the world. It was probably the most gorgeous building on the earth. And he goes in and he wrecks an altar to Zeus and he puts it on top of the altar. And then he makes, he actually sacrifices a pig on the altar. This is December 16th, 167 BC, which is why he did not last long after that. <laughs> now, and you, if you know the Jews and you know God's word, the, they, at that time, they were not having them some pig, although we know that some of the best bacon in the world. But but anyway, so so that was like the hot biggest insult. That was a that was an abomination. That was a huge desecration of the temple, and and you'll see Daniel's prophecy that talk about this. Okay, so uh, he's killed, and 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 the Romans come in. I mean, he's not killed. Uh, instantly, he's not struck dead when he does the sacrifices the pig on the altar. But shortly thereafter, he's defeated and killed, and the Hasidim uh, retake the temple and control it. Meanwhile, the Romans are marching in, and in 146 BC is when the Romans begin their march. They destroy Carthage and Corinth, and Corinth becomes an important place later. You know. And and they're 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 marching, and they're in Africa, and they're just marching across. And the Romans slowly take over, like they're unstoppable, and they expand. So now, if you know, and we just don't know geography that well, but now your the whole empire is, is from Italy through Greece, part of Germany and Britain and uh, Turkey and uh, all over. You know, the Roman Empire was huge; it was massive. And, and so, um, but it was almost too big to control. So they had little people controlling all over the place. And then someone came up with a great idea. His name was Julius Caesar, who said, just make me like the dictator. Julius Caesar was born in 100 uh, BC and lived till 44 BC. And, and so um, he, he, when he was... Uh, 40 years old in 60 BC, that's when he rose to power and 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 uh, he made an alliance with Pompey. A lot of you know this history. And then of course he turned on Pompey later. And, and in 46 BC, he declared himself the dictator. And then they killed him in 44, two years later. That didn't last long. And, but now, but he was the first in line of 10 emperors that ruled, uh, and really focused their energies on uh, Israel f all the way up till 70 AD. There was 10 emperors in a row, starting with Julius Caesar, who focused their attention on what was going on in uh, Israel and sent governors there to control the Jews. And I, well, I know why, but it's like amazing that the Jews were always at the center, no matter whether it was the Persians or the Iranians or Iraqis or the Romans or the Greeks, didn't matter. The Assyrians, like Israel, it was so important what Israel was doing, and there weren't even that many Jews. There's a million of them. It doesn't matter because there was something about God's people that they had to focus on them. And so um, there's 10 emperors in a row. So after Julius Caesar is assassinated, a two brute, and I can't believe you did this, right? Then um, uh, maybe 16 years after that, they really declare Augustus the first official emperor, but Julius was the first. And then there's nine that follow Julius Caesar. There's Augustus, who was um, emperor from 27 BC until AD 14. So Augustus was the one who was the emperor while Jesus was alive. Which is dead? Yes, Augustus Rhodes. They don't know who that is. So, um, so, and because Vicky's not even watching. So, um, and then Tiberius, then Caligula from 37 until 41. So Augustus and Tiberius were uh, were emperors while, during, while Jesus is alive. And Caligula, then uh, Claudius from like 41 to 54. 
because now we're going up, right? Then Nero, then there's three, in one year, there were three emperors. So all, most of these emperors reigned for at least 10 or 15 years. But in one year, there were three successive emperors that were killed. The Roman armies are surrounding Jerusalem. In 66 AD, Nero goes crazy, and he starts uh, persecuting the Jews who are, who are living, and the Christians who are now living in Rome. Because Paul, when Jesus said, this gospel must be spread, Paul started spreading it. And so now there's Christians all over the empire. So that's one <laughs> good thing about Rome controlling everything because Paul could just go everywhere. It was all Rome and he had free passage all over the known world at that time, all the way from to India to Africa, through Europe, up through Syria, you know, that whole and huge expanse of the known world at that time. And um, so Christianity is big time, big time in, in, in Rome at this point. And Nero, remember, he goes, remember like you were there. But Nero goes crazy. And he starts killing Christians. Well, he starts burning parts of Rome and then blaming the Christians and saying they did it and putting them to death. And then he says, and now we're going to attack Israel, Judah, the, you know, those last two, that, that southern Israel, where the Jews are. We're going to attack them. And he sends armies. And in 66 and a half AD, armies are surrounding uh, Israel, the known Israel, Ju Ju Judah. Okay. Anyway, so Jerusalem, there's a really Jerusalem, and that's when Jesus says, where well, we started, how long ago, bless my heart, 45 minutes ago, when you see armies surrounding, then get out, because that's now the end, and in succession, Nero died, and then three emperors took his place, Galba, Oth, and Vitellius, in like a six-month period, and that's important that there were suddenly three, and then they were replaced by Vespasian, the one big one who actually gave the order to destroy Jerusalem. Because in one of the visions of Daniel, there are three horns that are replaced by one. And so there are three emperors that are replaced by this one emperor and uh, Vespasian. And he gives the order for his son, Titus, to actually attack. And he's the one that attacks. He awaits till after the Passover. All, Jews come from all over the world because they're simply, they've surrounded Jerusalem, but they haven't done anything. They're just sitting there. So, and for three Passovers, people come and go, people come and go. In 70 AD, Passover happens and Jews come from all over the world. The smart people, though, have left because Jesus had warned them, when you see them surround, get out. So the Christians had left and went to a place called Pella, and they're hiding there. But the Jews who didn't, Jesus doesn't know what he's talking about. He was making all that up. They show up. They're there. They celebrate the Passover, and in between Passover, and right after Passover, that's when he attacks. So they didn't get a chance to leave. Um, the reason we know this history so specifically is, is uh, that um, war broke out between the few Jews who, who had moved back to, to who were in Galilee and in the northern part, uh, uh, you know, north of Jerusalem. The zealots were trying to fight the Romans. It was kind of the zealots that started this all. Simon was a zealot. There's certain people that are mentioned they're zealots, and we, we just kind of, oh, yeah, he's a zealot. What does that mean? That means he's crazy. He's radical. And so um, they are fighting the Romans, and the Romans are killing them because there's 50,000 Romans, and there's, you know, a thousand of them. It was kind of, it was a suicide mission. And speaking of which, once the, they saw that the Romans were going to come in and take over those northern cities, they uh, said, let's all just kill ourselves because it's because to be a slave to the Romans is the worst thing that can happen. And so they all killed themselves and they killed their wives and children so that the Romans would walk in and see nothing but death. One person said, yeah, I'll do that, and then didn't. His name was Josephus. He snuck out. And Josephus is the one who wrote the history of the Jews, the war of the Jews, and, and this antiquity, and these books, and recorded all these things. So he recorded everything that happened, and that's, you, we can just read word for word what happened from the time Jesus died until 70 AD. He records everything. Um, Vitellius, I mean Vespasian, that tenth horn, that tenth toe, that tenth emperor gives the order. Titus comes in, destroys the temple, and um, 
and and so this is this whole history of the Assyrians, the Babylonians, the Medes and the Persians, the Greeks and the Romans, what was going to happen to Israel so that they would be dispersed so that the, the second time the temple would be destroyed and then they'd be dispersed for a couple of thousand years and then finally brought back together. Daniel, Nebuchadnezzar has a dream about this all happening and he gives the interpretation he he gives the dream to a gentile because this is when the times of the gentiles began this is when the times of the gentiles began and so god starts using gentile nations to corral the jews and to scare them into basically continuing to worship him and they hold out hold out and he keeps warning them he gives them warning after warning and here's what's going to happen here's when that and he, he gives them warning so that when it happens, they will go, oh, my goodness, this is exactly what God said would happen. We better check. So I guess that other part about us being judged will probably happen, too. So that's one reason for the warning so that when it happens, people so that you'll go, well, if that happened, this other part's probably going to happen. We better get it together. They didn't. OK, in, in Daniel chapter two, I just want to read this quickly. And then we're going to go through Daniel because. This is what, because Jesus quotes Daniel, and that's his final nail in the coffin when he's explaining what's going to happen. And they all know the, every, the rest of it, and we need to know the rest of it, too, so we understand what Jesus is talking about. And I want you to understand why I'm saying this is, Jesus is talking about this. He's not talking about all the other stuff we've been told for years and years that he really was talking about. This is what he's talking about. Uh, so remember Nebuchadnezzar, the Babylonians, when he has a dream right? The king of Babylon. And Daniel says, I can interpret your dream. Uh, Daniel chapter two, verse 20. Uh, Blessed be the name of God forever and ever for God, for wisdom and might are his. And he changes the times and the seasons. He removes kings and raises up kings. He gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to those who have understanding. So he's saying God raises up a king and he'll, he'll take them away. So Nebuchadnezzar, he raised you up. He will take you away. You know, I gave you life and I'll take it from you. Okay, that's what a lot of daddies will say to their kids. Uh, verse 28, but there is a God in heaven who reveals secrets and he has made known to King Nebuchadnezzar what will be in the latter days. There's a reason why he chose Nebuchadnezzar to tell instead of a Jewish prophet, he told a Gentile one. Your dream, your visions of your head upon your bed were these. The images of your head, you, he envisioned uh, a man with a head of gold, chested arms of silver, belly and thighs of bronze, legs of iron, and peats and feet, Pete's. Feet's <laughs> partly of iron. Pete's don't pale me now. <laughs> and feet partly of iron and partly of clay. And then in the dream, right? So, and we've all this famous dream. You have a head of gold, uh, arms, uh, chest and arms of silver, belly and thighs of bronze, legs of iron, and feet of iron and clay. And what that clay is is fascinating. We will, we will get to that. He says, uh, and then in the dream, the stone shows up and smashes this man of iron and clay and all that. And, and, and then that stone becomes this cornerstone. And he tells them, uh, you, O king, are king of kings, and for the God of heaven has given you kingdom, power, strength, and glory, and wherever the children of men dwell, or the beasts of the fields, or the birds of heaven, he's given them to your hand. But he says, you're the head of gold, and then after you, another king will rise. He goes on and he says, whereas you saw the feet and toes partly of potter's clay and partly of iron, that kingdom shall be divided. That final kingdom, that iron kingdom of Rome is going to be divided. There's a reason why it's mixed of clay and iron what, and what the clay means. And um, he says, but in the days of these kings, I'm, I'm down in verse 44. In the days of these kings, and these are the ones, uh, okay, let me go back to verse 43. And you saw iron mixed with ceramic clay, with, with potter's clay, that they will mingle with the seed of men, that they will not adhere to one another, just as iron does not mix with clay. So there'll be some mixing of these, this iron and this clay. And in the days of these kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed. So during that kingdom, that iron kingdom mixed with clay, He'll, God's going to set up his own kingdom, which will never be destroyed. And the kingdom shall be shall not be left to other people. It shall break in pieces and consume all these other kingdoms, and it shall stand forever. So he's saying all these kings will come. 
uh, Babylonian kings, Roman kings, Greek kings, all that. But in those final days, there's a king who's going to come and his kingdom will stand forever. It won't pass away. And that's what Jesus is leading to. He's saying, this is now the, I am here and I'm establishing that kingdom that he was telling you about. I'm going to, I'm breaking that final kingdom, which is Rome. And we'll explain all that. And my kingdom is an eternal kingdom. It's an everlasting kingdom. It's not a kingdom that will part. Once Christianity came, once that kingdom appeared, it hasn't gone away. You can't get rid of it. It will be here forever. It's that eternal kingdom. And that's the kingdom we, we want to lead everybody to. So Jesus is saying, this is now that day of vengeance. This is that time that was prophesied. And I'm just emphasizing this because you're going to see verses that you said, oh, I always thought those verses were talking about in the future. He said, no, these verses are talking about the end of these prophecies that everybody, that, that Jeremiah gave, that Isaiah gave, that Daniel gave, that all these people gave. This is the end. I am the end. I am the fulfillment of all these prophecies. And now it's going to happen. And yes, Isaiah said, There'll be a day when you'll be gathered a second time back to Israel. But that day's far away. But please know that this is that final time. And this is judgment. And I'm giving you all this space and all this warning. And he does that for us. He gives us space and warning to change, 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 change. And then finally he says, okay, I'm done. But, and so, hearken, harden not your hearts, you know, we if we don't pay attention to these warnings and look at the sign. So we're going to look at two things during this time period. We're going to look at the fulfillment in Jesus's day. And then who did talk about today? Who was the person that was talking about that last thing that Isaiah brought up when Israel's brought back? Which prophet did talk about that? Jesus wasn't talking about that. Jesus was only talking about what was that temple that was going to be destroyed right then, this generation. Those standing here, you'll see this fulfilled. But one prophet did talk about today. And so we're going to separate it because they've been mingled together for too long. We're going to separate them. So thank you again for listening in to this long history lesson. But it will help as we study Daniel because we need to study Daniel so we know what the heck Jesus was talking about. And then we need to study the book of Revelation. Okay, but not the whole book. We'll just skip through it because you're oh, my God, I'll be 90 years old when he finally finishes that. And then Jesus will be back like with a time watch. Like, hello, I'm trying to come back here and you keep listening. Okay, so thank you so much for uh, listening in. I'll see some of you Sunday. I keep saying see you, but I'll speak to you. You'll see me on Sunday, and because uh, we're in the in the book of Genesis, uh, and uh, I'll see some of you again next week. I'm so appreciative. It's just I'm just amazing to me that you take the time to listen to me rattle on as I do. Okay, thank you, and God bless you.